So picking up where we left off at the end of the last video, we have created the frequency table with pivot tables based on the stacked file. In the next step, we created the cumulative frequency table with uh, the first just copying that first row and then with this accumulating function where we're doing the sum of the previous total plus the value in the corresponding cell in the adjacent table. Now we're going to have to create a third version or a third table. This one is known as the cumulative percentage table or cumulative percent. And this formula is very simple, but you need to have one piece of information. And just to remind you where I'm getting it from, we know that there are 115 respondents. We verified that we had the right counts here at the bottom of our cumulative frequency table. And so I am going to convert these cumulative frequencies into cumulative percentages. And I do that by pointing to the corresponding cell in the adjacent table and dividing by the total. In this case, it's 115. Now we're working through this example where the answer is 115. When you do the homework exercise with the, the leggings, it's not 115. So just be careful about that. It's a common mistake I've seen in the homework assignments is that students just plug in that same value 115, but 115 is the value for this example, but there's nothing special about that number other than that's the total for this example. So you have to update that number with, with the total. Uh, I'm going to change the format on that into a percentage. And this one, unlike the other one, in the cumulative frequency table, we had a different formula in the first and second row. Then it was the same for the rest of the rows. In this one, every cell has got that same formula. It's the corresponding cell divided by 115. And just like we verified that everything worked by making sure these all totaled up to 115, we're going to verify that our cumulative percentages are adding up properly. Everything should add up to 100% in the last row. Again, be, be careful about that grand total row that we had over here. I've seen that's another common mistake I see students make when they're just kind of following the steps but not really understanding or paying attention to what they're doing and ending up with you know, double the counts here, right? And then ending up with 200%. So make sure you end up with whatever your total is, in this case, 115, and that these all add up to 100%. So up till now, I mean, technically speaking, we haven't actually done the Van Westendorp. We've just, we've asked the questions and we've calculated some cumulative percentages. The final step in creating the modern Van Westendorp is to invert a couple of the columns. Now in the modern version, the two columns that we invert or flip are the cheap column and the two cheap column. And so what I've traditionally done to highlight that is I make, again, I, I've still got, you know, like my dollar figures are here as, as the labels, you know, it, they're gonna be labels in the chart. Make sure that this cell is blank. If you end up with anything in that cell, uh, it can create problems for you. So when we say invert, well, what do we mean by invert? Everything here goes from 0% to 100%. We want the opposite. We want to go from 100% to 0%. So if 0% of people say that $5 is cheap, 100% don't say that, right? Now, it's really what we're saying is 100% don't say it's cheap. But, you know, just for convenience, we'll convert that into 100% say it's not cheap. We can argue on the semantics that it's not exactly the same thing, but now how do we make that calculation happen? The way that you invert it is you just do 100% minus, or 100% is just equal to 1. So we can say equals 1 minus, say it with me, the corresponding cell in the adjacent table. In this case, for cell U5, that corresponding cell is cell O5. For expensive, we're just going to copy it. Equals, point to the corresponding cell in the adjacent table. For too cheap, we're also going to invert it. Equals 1 minus the value in the corresponding cell in the adjacent table. And too expensive is also just a copy. So just equals and then point to 
the corresponding cell in the adjacent table. The nice thing, again, once I have that, the formulas paste, or the formulas entered properly in the first row of the table, it's copy and paste it all the way through. And so you should have the two red columns going essentially 100 to zero. Two cheap always ends up being a little bit less than 100% because the lowest price is always going to be, you know, a too cheap price, right? So there's something in the first row in that one, whereas in not cheap, nobody mentioned that price yet. And the other two are the same as before. They go zero to 100. Now, I'm going to show this to you just real quick, just to make sure that you understand what's going on. If I were to just build my, my chart off of the cumulative percentage, so if I say insert, I'm going to do a line chart. I get four lines. They all start at zero and at 100. And they're, they're not exactly parallel, right? But I get four lines all going in the same direction. In other words, there's no intersection. Everything begins and ends at zero and 100. I guess you could say those are the points of intersection. But there's not that crisscrossing um, aspect to it, right? So let's get rid of that one. The reason that we're inverting these columns is because that's what changes it from four going in the same direction to two and two. So uh, assuming you've got everything set up here properly, that everything's going 100 to zero or zero to 100, this cell above the prices is blank. These are labeled properly. Click anywhere in the table, go to insert and select that basic 2D line chart. And there you have, it should look familiar because it's the same one I used in the PowerPoint deck. I'm just gonna scroll over. Make it a little bit bigger. Give it a title. Like Nike Shoes Modern VWPSM. And, you know, if you want to get fancy, you know, you could, uh, ooh, make it, uh, you know, use one of the preset uh, chart design formats there. I always like the one with the dark background. Um, but so there's your chart. And now, well, what exactly are the prices? This can be a little bit fuzzy because, you know, like where they cross might not be entirely clear. What I typically do in Excel is I'll just hover my, my arrow, my arrow cursor over it. And this is telling me the too cheap point is $60. And the too expensive point, or in other words, here's the PME. That was the PMC was at 60. Here's my PME, first base, right? Third base, first base. This is at 99. If I cared... <laughs> The indifference price point here at second base is at 80, and the optimal price point at home base is at 70. But I want that. I'm making the throw from third to first. Very common for those of you that you know, are baseball fans. You know this. Um, so that's 60 to 99. If on your test you said 100, but I'm saying 99 because it's not real clear You know, when you're looking down here. I'm not going to ding you points for that. It'll be clear that if you did the chart properly and you're looking at the right point. But that essentially, that's your modern Van Westendorp, right? And, and your final answer, you're going to do your chart, and then you're going to specify the acceptable price range. Uh, again, it's a very uh, crude tool, but it's also, it's kind of neat. And again, it's something that you can learn in, you know, in one session in a pricing analytics class. And it gives you some I think, insight into the uh, kind of the thinking behind this type of an analysis. Now, I told you I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on the original, and I'm not. I'm not going to go through it right now. The only difference between the modern and the original is in this last step. Instead of flipping too cheap, you would flip expensive. So it would be one minus, one minus, copy, copy. And that would produce the other chart that, uh, that, that we looked at in the PowerPoint deck.